Minister for our, uh, our congregation, and it is uh, my good pleasure also to be the garrison chaplain here at Fort Belvoir. If this is your first Sunday with us, welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, our uh, worship service here at 08. I hope you've had a, uh, a good Thanksgiving weekend, and uh, what a remarkable Sunday morning. It is, uh, it's crisp. When I took a look at the thermometer, it said minus one. And so, and so uh, blue skies are, are one thing, uh, the temperature uh, is another, but it is just uh, good to gather together as uh, the people of the Lord, the church here on, uh, on Fort uh, Belvoir. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, just a uh, couple of announcements. I don't think we have Sunday school this morning. So uh, no Sunday school this morning, but we do have coffee downstairs uh, for fellowship after worship, should you so, uh, so wish to join us uh, for a little fellowship right after worship. On the, I think it's the 12th of December, we will have the U.S. Army Band Quartet uh, with a Christmas uh, concert for us on Sunday morning. It'll be very nice. Between, ten, it'll be from 1045 to 1115. So our 11 o'clock worship service will be pushed back. Uh, the start time will be pushed back 30 minutes to accommodate for that. But that'll be a nice uh, seasonal uh, uh, concert. So come and uh, put that on your calendar and join us. And, this morning at 11 o'clock in the REC, we have an Advent wreath uh, workshop that will begin. And so uh, I invite you to, uh, to join for that. I, I think you may have required an RSVP for that, but if you show up, I'll bet you we have a wreath for you. So uh, without any further ado, brothers and sisters, uh, I invite you to uh, stand with me for, uh, for the invocation. From Psalm 20, we see uh, the wonder of the glory uh, of the King. We will show for joy when you are victorious, and we'll lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O Lord, save the king. Answer us when we call. Heavenly Father, I thank you, O God, that uh, you have saved the king, that uh, Christ uh, our Lord, who was crucified on Calvary's cross, buried dead, was resurrected and ascended and reigns on high today, and we look forward to Christ's return. I pray that as we enter into this season of Advent, as we focus on the wonder that Christ has come, that we will focus on the glory of his coming again, and that we, would, we as your church, would be ready to meet you, our glorious King. Enable us to trust in you this morning. Come and bless our worship, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, let's turn. In our uh, opening hymn to uh, hymn number 83, uh, there's something about that name. Father, there is a marvelous beauty and wonder about the name of Jesus. Enable us uh, to adore you in a way that is worthy of your goodness and your glory this morning. Holy Spirit, uh, come. Uh, we love you. Help us to love you uh, with a greater purity and devotion as we gather this morning. I ask in Christ's name. Amen. 
Let's continue to worship by turning to uh, hymn number 408, How Firm a Foundation. Brothers and sisters, uh, take a moment and uh, greet one another in the name of Jesus. Oh, yeah, please be seated. A historic uh, confession that we have uh, as the church uh, spoken for centuries is found in the Apostles' Creed, this concise summary of our uh, biblical faith. So I ask a simple question, brothers and sisters. Uh, Christian, uh, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to uh, pray with me, uh, brothers and sisters, as we allow uh, the Lord to search our hearts, just as a congregation and as individuals. There will be an opportunity for silent reflection and uh, confession, and I will lead us in a uh, corporate period of confession, and then we will hear uh, the assurance of forgiveness in the gospel from uh, the Lord's word. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, you are holy, holy, holy. And those who would uh, seek to approach uh, 
you uh, must be likewise uh, holy, spotless, and pure. Clean hands, O God, and a clean heart. I confess, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, that as I uh, consider uh, my thoughts, my actions, my words uh, this past week, I have not done what I should have done, and I have done what I should not have done. Heavenly Father, as I think of uh, your law, the summary, whether it be the summary of the Ten Commandments, or uh, the simple summation that, uh, that Jesus gave us in regards to love, loving you and uh, loving our neighbor, our brothers and sisters. Lord, uh, I have broken your commandments, and I have failed to love you, and I have failed to love my brothers and sisters. I have failed to love my neighbor. I ask that in this, uh, this quiet Holy Spirit that you would come and that you would search the hearts of your people and that you would extend uh, the gift of repentance, that we as your church uh, would turn from trusting in ourselves and that we would turn from delighting in sin and that, uh, O oh Lord, that we would trust in you as our King. gospel uh, declares uh, that he who knew no sin uh, became sin, that uh, we might be the very righteousness of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your gospel that saves, that Christ uh, was a spotless lamb, and uh, through his atonement on Calvary's cross, uh, our sins have been covered and washed away. And you don't just treat us as though we had never sinned, but you see us in the obedience of your Son, the Lord Jesus, as though we have perfectly kept your law, and that in Christ we have a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. And so we give you praise and glory for that we, we can come and approach your holy throne. We come in the righteousness that is not our own. We come in the righteousness that is the gift of Christ. We come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you and we praise you for such a rich salvation. We are your children, and you are our Heavenly Father, and we, uh, we give you praise and glory this morning. Enable us to continue to worship you as your church and to know the power of your salvation personally and corporately. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I invite the uh, ushers to come forward to uh, receive our uh, tithes and offerings, and then after we've received the tithes and offerings, I will uh, just have a simple prayer of thanks, and we will sing the doxology.
Well, Father, I thank you for the generosity of your people, an expression of uh, their gratitude and joy, their love for you. I ask that you would take these gifts and use them for the glory of your name, the advancement of uh, your loving kindness here on Fort Belvoir, outside of the gates and around the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I ask and give thanks. Amen. I invite you to stand and let us sing the doxology together. brothers and sisters. Good morning. As my wife lights the candle of hope, we will start with our Old Testament scripture reading, which is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. Listen for the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. Again, listen for the word of the Lord. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourself and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your heart be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you might have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. May the Lord add his blessing to our understanding of his holy word. Amen. Thank you, Stephen, Linda. Now let us go as a congregation before the Lord with our uh, petitions and uh, requests. And then I will conclude with uh, leading us uh, corporately in, with the Lord's Prayer. 
I invite you to once again to pray with me, brothers and sisters. Uh, Almighty God, we, uh, we thank you that you uh, invite us uh, to bring our requests, our petitions uh, to you, and so we do in the name of Jesus. I, I thank you, Almighty God, for this congregation. I thank you for the leaders that you have given to us, and I pray that uh, you would bless them, bless our pastors, uh, bless uh, our parish council, bless those who serve on our executive team and our community teams, our Sunday school teachers, our Awanas, Lord, PWOC, Belvoir Men of Faith. Oh, we have um, so many ministries uh, that do take place, and I, uh, I, I ask that you would strengthen those who serve, that you would be their very life and their joy, and that you'd use them as instruments of uh, breathing uh, <laughs> the very life of Christ into our hearts and our souls, that we would grow in our knowledge and our love for you and our capacity to enjoy you and to make a difference for you each and every day. Lord, sanctify this, your church here on Fort Belvoir, that she would be uh, just basking in your grace and in your mercy in your very goodness. And, oh God, that we would love one another with a love that is just profound and is otherworldly. Lord, may we be uh, salt and light in contrast to uh, the darkness and the fallenness of this world that is around us. Lord, save us from the deceptions of the evil one. For from the beginning, he has convinced us that we could uh, be like you, discerning, defining good and evil. Lord, help us to discern good and evil based upon your word. Lord, I pray that uh, we might be faithful as your church in making disciples here, that others would know the freedom of Christ here on Fort Belvoir. Lord, we pray for those in authority over us. We pray for our Commander-in-Chief, President Biden, that you would uh, bless him and his family. We are thankful for them. Give them wisdom uh, as they lead. May they be instruments of peace, uh, not just here uh, within our country, but Lord, uh, use uh, our Commander-in-Chief and those who advise him as instruments of peace uh, around this world. We think of those who are deployed. We ask uh, for uh, our sailors, for our airmen, for our Marines, for our soldiers, for the Coast Guardsmen, for, for the Guardians, that you would uh, watch over them, be their strength and their protection, enable them to successfully accomplish their mission. And Lord, that you would uh, bring them home safely to their families. Uh, Lord, we uh, think of members of our congregation who are grieving uh, today. I think of uh, Lay Anciano, the passing of her husband Frank this past week. We thank you for our sister and for her family, for her children and her grandchildren. May you comfort uh, them and give them the very hope of Christ, even right now, on this Sunday. Almighty God, I, uh, I thank you for our pastors. Bless them and strengthen them. And I thank you for uh, Jonathan, who will come in a few minutes uh, to uh, preach the gospel to us from Luke. Uh, touch our brother's lips. And uh, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see your glory as uh, your word is declared. And bless him and his family. Uh, Almighty God, I pray for the commands here on this post, that uh, you would uh, be with uh, those who lead, uh, that you would grant them wisdom, that uh, command sergeants, majors would be uh, exemplary, and inspirational, that you would bless uh, our NCOs. I thank you for those who are serving right here. I thank you for Sergeant Sproul and Specialist Dixon. Uh, encourage and strengthen them and the others across uh, our team within the RSO. And Almighty God, uh, I pray that uh, as we recite uh, back to you, uh, the very words of Christ, the Lord's Prayer, that you would impress upon our hearts its truth and its power. 
And so we pray unto you as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, brothers and sisters, and let us sing hymn number 656, Take Time to Be Holy. be seated. So we have a new member of the team, brothers and sisters, and I just want to uh, introduce to you uh, Chaplain uh, Major uh, Jonathan Porter and his dear wife Valerie, who's right there, and their children. So I'm not going to, I, I took notes and now I need to find my notes. Jacob and Evelyn and William and Elijah, and they have a son, John, who unfortunately is in the Air Force. But uh, we are so grateful that uh, this family has uh, come and will be uh, moving on to a uh, post in a month or so. And the beautiful news is that this, this is a team. Jonathan, who works uh, at the Office of the Chief of Chaplains with Chaplain Wake, who worships with us in the world of RM. Uh, his dear wife is going to be our community coordinator starting in December. So we'll more formally in, uh, in welcome uh, Valerie, uh, in December, when the family uh, is uh, is permanently settled in a part of uh, this community, so we're so excited. And this brother is endorsed by.
by the Christian Missionary Alliance, and that is where I was first saved and uh, raised up in the faith, licensed uh, and ordained, and uh, the two churches I pastored were Christian Missionary Alliance. So a kindred spirit here in Jonathan. We are so happy you were here, brother, so welcome. We look forward to the gospel. Good morning, and thank you for that uh, introduction, sir. It's good to be here with you this morning. The scripture passage today is what was read during the Advent lighting, Luke uh, chapter 21, verses 25 to 36. I will not reread the scripture reading, but I'll be referring back to it throughout today. And I, I will say I'm really happy to be here. A few weeks ago, I attended the 11 o'clock service because 8 o'clock is way too early for me to be awake. But it was nice. After the service, I ran into several people uh, in the congregation that were at the PX uh, enjoying fellowship. So I realized, wow, this is a, a great congregation to be part of because they like each other after service. They don't immediately try to get away from each other after the service. So it was good to be here. It's good to be back in the area. I'm from Gambrels, Maryland. And so I've actually been living in my parents' basement for a couple uh, months now, and my family is in Michigan where we have a house. But soon we'll be living on Belvoir. I work at the Pentagon, and it's good to be home. I've been asking the military to bring me back to the East Coast for several years, and every year they send me a little further west. And the last stop was Hawaii. That's pretty far away from Maryland. And I have to say, some people think it's weird that I'd rather be in Virginia than Hawaii, but this is where I'm from. And as lovely as Hawaii is, the Army has a way to make lovely things miserable. Uh, some of you may have been in the Army, I don't know. But Hawaii was great, but training, they would take us to a swamp in Louisiana to train. And I experienced my worst Army training ever when I was stationed in Hawaii. One time we went to train with my squadron uh, to Louisiana and the Army in infinite wisdom decided I needed my smallpox inoculation before the training. And so I got that and it made me sick for about a half a week. I don't usually get sick too often but I was pretty miserable and I was just about recovered from that when it was time to go to the field and train and we did a convoy which was simulated because you really can't drive for eight hours on Fort Polk. So we just sat in our Humvees for eight hours and we should be sleeping. And it rained and my Humvee leaked. But it was okay because I was wearing mop gear, the chemical gear that protects you from chemical attacks. But that was a time in my army training when I realized that the chemical gear is not waterproof. And as the rain leaked into the Humvee and poured onto my mop gear, I soon found out that it was not waterproof, it was saturated, and I was soaked. And that stuff took three days to dry out, and it was cold at night, and I was miserable, and I got sick again, and everybody was miserable. And the op four, the opposition forces, they always attack at night when we should be sleeping. And that was miserable too. And I remember talking to some of the soldiers and they were just hoping that maybe they would get notionally killed in action so that they could go to where they keep the dead bodies and sleep. And I could understand why they would feel that way. It was so miserable. And one evening in the misery during an evening attack, I ran into the sergeant major and he was different. He was happy. It was like he was in a, a kid in a candy store. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread for the Sergeant Major. Everybody else is miserable, but he's happy because he is seeing his soldiers in action. He is having the opportunity to see if their training has worked, to see where the holes are in the training, to make sure his soldiers are prepared for real combat. And so as I thought about the Sergeant Major and his attitude when everything was miserable, I thought about something Thomas Paine wrote during the Revolutionary War. During the darkest time in our nation's revolution in December, in the winter, before the war had turned in favor of the revolutionaries, Thomas Paine wrote, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier 
and the sunshine, sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. The ones who stand in the times of darkness are what I would call the winter soldiers. And I've entitled my message today, the Lord's Winter Soldiers, because Christ, in his final message before going to the cross, is speaking to his disciples, and he's speaking to us that in the day of darkness, we have to stand. When the world is falling apart, we have to stand. And as I look at this passage, I three, see three things for us to learn about standing and being the winter soldiers in the times of darkness. And the first is our hope. As believers in Christ, we have a hope. And Jesus describes the coming of the Son of Man. He says there will be suns in the sun, signs of the sun and moon, in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations, perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing within them for fear and expectation of those things to come upon the earth. The calamity that is coming when God returns, when Christ returns to earth, it says that people's hearts are going to melt. The scripture literally says they're going to stop breathing. Our English word would be, would be asphyxia. They're going to die from fear. And maybe some of you experienced fear in your life, or maybe you're like me and you've just had one of those really bad dreams where you try to scream and you can't make a sound, or you try to run and you can't move. The scripture says that fear is going to come over the earth at the coming of the Christ. And Revelation says this, that the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and in the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? The hearts of the world are going to collapse, and people are going to be praying that it will just end. But this is what Jesus says to us. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. When everything is turning miserable, we are going to be happy because this is what we want. Christ is coming. This is our blessed hope. The scripture says we want Christ to return. We understand what it's like to have Jesus in our lives, and we understand what it's like to be new creations. We know what it was like without Jesus. We know what it is like with Jesus, and we want more Jesus. We pray in chapel every week for forgiveness and we ask Christ to make us new every week because we know what it's like. We stumble and fall each and every week, but our hope is that Christ is coming and he's going to fully renew us and give us new bodies. And we're going to experience a new heaven and new earth. This is our hope. The world isn't thinking about Christ coming the world isn't thinking about spiritual things, but we are. We're thinking about the hope we have in Jesus Christ, that all the sadness, all the pain, all the bitterness of this world will fade away and will be nothing but a distant memory, if even that our hearts will be full with only joy in the presence of Christ, the glorious presence of God. We have a hope, and our hope is built on the second thing, and that is Christ's promise. The winter soldiers who will stand in the day of darkness believe the promise of Jesus Christ. He said to them, look to the fig tree and all the trees. When you see they are already budding and see, you know for yourselves that summer is near. When we see that the trees are starting to have the leaves come on, we know summer is coming. It is going to happen. It's like when a woman is going to give birth. Certain things happen, and you know it's coming. Years ago, we have five children, 
In the fourth one, she was interested in being born really quickly. And we went to the doctors for Val's checkup and everything was good and we drove home and I pulled into the driveway and Valerie said, we need to go back to the hospital. And I said, I know, I'm not a dummy, I was listening, I'm a good husband, next Wednesday at eight o'clock. And Val said, no, right now. Like, oh, okay, so I went inside, told the babysitter, we're gonna be a little bit longer, we gotta go back to the hospital. We went to the hospital, Val told the nurses, I'm having the baby. And they chuckled, okay, let's fill out these papers. It's almost dinner time, would you like something to eat? And they brought in a tray for her to eat. And she's like, no, I'm, I'm having the baby. And they're like, oh, okay, silly head. Anyway, so they're trying to get her to fill out these papers. And they're like, well, she doesn't want the meal. Why don't you eat it? I'm looking at my wife and I see the signs. I'm like, I'm not gonna eat. I don't think that's a good idea. And the doctor came in and examined her and he's like, oh, the baby's here. You know, it's time. She knew it was time. The nurses didn't realize it was time. She had the baby very quickly. I walked down the hall, called my folks, called her folks, came back in and that food was still sitting at the corner of the delivery room and I, I looked at it and the coffee was still piping hot. That's how fast the baby had come. And so Val had Evelyn, was nursing the baby and I was drinking hot coffee, but it happened fast. It is going to happen. It's like when you go to a wedding. Has anybody ever been to a wedding? Okay, some of you have been. Some of you are together and you've never been to weddings. You might need to talk to me or Chaplain Fakeney. Um, but at the wedding, the bride is in place. Uh, the groom is in place. The pastor is in place. The parents get seated. The groomsmen, the bridesmaids get in a position. And everything is in position for the wedding ceremony. And we're just waiting for the bride. And then they start playing, here comes the bride. And everybody stands up. But when everybody's in place and everybody's up front, you know it is going to happen. And Jesus is telling us it is going to happen. When, when, Paul, when Luke wrote this, none of this had come to pass. He was writing things that were insane. Jesus had said things that didn't make sense. This temple, which was the greatest temple in the history of the world at that time, it was huge. There are rocks in the foundation of the temple, stones that weigh over a million pounds. And Jesus is saying, nothing is going to stand. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Everything you believe in the false prophets are saying that God's going to rescue you is wrong. The Christ is here and you've rejected him. Everything we read has happened except for Christ coming and it is going to happen. And he says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And many things have been written about the generations. And you can look at the other uh, gospel accounts and you can understand what generation means and you can read commentaries. I don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but what I do need to say is that Jesus isn't giving us a time frame. Jesus isn't giving us a time frame. But in the language he uses when he says, pass away three different times, he's giving us a parallel. And what he's saying is this is going to happen. It is certainty. And our hope is based on the promise of Jesus Christ. And we, looking back, realize that when Jesus said these things, none of them had happened. But within a few short years, all of them had happened. And only one thing has happened, and that is Jesus Christ himself returning and he is going to return. And while we wait, that is the third thing. We have a hope that we will be fully transformed. It's our blessed hope. It's based on his promise. But we, if we want to be the winter soldiers and we want to hold our heads up high and we want to love God and love each other when the world is falling apart, we have a calling, and that calling is to share Christ with the world around us. He says, take heed with yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, for that day will come unexpectedly, and it will come as a snare on those who, are, who deal, dwell on the earth, on the whole earth. And he says to us, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. 
it is coming. And this world doesn't want to think about spiritual things. People of the world, it says drunkenness and carousing, and that's like the, the greatest example is you see a heroin addict or something who's hunched over in a park, and they, they're not even, they're a shell of a human being because they're trying to forget reality and trying to forget about God. But in real life, it's the little things for most of us that come up. It's our work. It's our families, it's our bills, it's our houses, it's everything but God. And the temptation of this world is to have our minds away from Jesus Christ and away from what God is doing in this world. And it's easy to forget, well, you know, Jesus is coming, but he's probably not coming in my lifetime. He hasn't come so far. For me, it's been 45 years. Uh, for this couple, it looks like maybe it's been like 49 years. So they've been around a little while and Christ hasn't come, so we can forget about it, right? The scripture warns us in Peter. He says, in the later days, there will be mockers who come, and they will tell us, where is the hope of his coming? And they'll say, from the days of, of creation, it's been the same. There's winter, there's harvest, there's sunrise, there's sundown. Where is the hope of his coming? And the scripture calls on us as believers to remember. And I'm going to read it because my memory isn't as good. He says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack, concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is his long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is the creator, and as fallen beings, we oftentimes, like Romans says, focus on the creation over the creator, and that is deception. We need to focus on the creator because he has created the earth. He has created time. He is above that. Our lives are like vapors. A day with him is like a thousand years. So if you look at the time of Jesus Christ to now, it's two days. We act like it's been forever. The scripture doesn't tell us when Christ is returning. The scripture does not give us a timeline. It doesn't give us a way to figure out a timeline. There's no way to cheat. It's like, well, that generation means this, so we know Jesus is coming back at this time. There is no timeline. But the scripture makes it very clear why Christ hasn't returned. And that is because God is still completing his work of redemption. All around the globe, every day, thousands upon thousands of people are receiving Jesus Christ. If Christ had come back at in 1900, none of us would be here. Every day he delays is an opportunity for people to come to Jesus Christ and come to salvation. And he is calling us as believers to engage in his work because as he says, first, the gospel will, pre will be preached in all the earth and then the end will come. He is calling us to watch he is calling us to pray. He is calling us to be engaged. Don't let the cares of this world turn off your brain to Jesus Christ. The scripture says that the people who have this hope that Jesus Christ is returning, that we are the children of God, and he is returning us to bring us to the Father. It says this hope purifies us. As I think back to Hawaii and Louisiana, and I look to the good times ahead being in Virginia, I think back to that training when everybody was miserable and people just wanted to die. And you know, that's a temptation, but I will tell you this. There was no way I was going to notionally die in make-believe combat. It wasn't going to happen because my denomination sent me to do ministry to the soldiers of our nation. They didn't send me to play dead in a tent and sleep. 
the army hired me to do ministry, not to play dead. And what happened is I accidentally, and don't tell anybody, turned the batteries upside down in my miles gear. That's what receives the laser when you're shot or blown up and it tells you you're dead so that mine wouldn't work. Accident. I wasn't going to die. I wasn't going to pretend to be dead. And I say this because there are people, Christian people, myself included, who sometimes we go through days or weeks, months, and even years where we are playing dead. And Jesus Christ is calling us to wake up. He is coming. Wake up, watch, and pray. Engage in what I am doing. You know, I'm never going to be like the sergeant major. I'll tell you that right now. I like my sleep. I like warm beds. I don't like being in the rain. But I'm also not going to play dead when I have a job to do. And spiritually, Jesus Christ is calling us not to play dead. Wake up. We all have a job to do. And it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be Billy Graham either. And I'm not going to be Mother Teresa, but I can be Jonathan. And you can be you. And what Christ is calling us to in the Advent season, and this is a wonderful season because it's calling us all as believers to turn to Christ and repent and focus on Christ and ask Christ to come into our lives in a fresh new way as we look to a second coming. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you've been through, Christ has a plan for you. As long as there is time remaining and we don't know how much time there is, Christ has a use for you in his kingdom. And I want to encourage you as we enter the Advent season, as we look to Christmas, I want to encourage you to ask Christ into your life in a fresh, new way. Ask him to renew your hope. Ask him to help you to believe his promise. He's made a promise believe. Ask him to embrace your calling. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are called to share the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for you. He has died for us. He has risen from the dead, and he has sent us a helper, the Holy Spirit, to live our lives in a new way, even in a dark world. If we open our hearts to Christ, we will be his winter soldiers. When the world is falling apart, when the world is shutting down all around us, we will lift up our heads and be the lights of Jesus Christ in the darkness. Through our hope in the sacrificial death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we will be among the worthy when he comes. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the blessed hope of the coming of Jesus Christ when all things will be made new. We thank you that you have called us out of the darkness into the light of Jesus Christ, and we celebrate this Advent season lighting candles representing the light of your hope, the peace, and the joy that you bring to our hearts. Father, we pray in the days ahead of us that we will be renewed in our vigor to stand and watch and pray and serve. Lord, I pray that you would be with each of us this week. Open our eyes to the world around us and provide opportunities for us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe this Advent we'll have opportunities to invite our friends and family to services. And maybe our friends and family through our testimonies can come to you because Lord, we know people who are in trouble and our hearts ache for them. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be your instruments Allow your Holy Spirit to work through us and reach out to those who are lost in the darkness. We ask these blessings 
fully relying on your promise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Porter. Thank you, brother. Brothers and sisters, uh, let us uh, stand and sing one of my favorite uh, Advent hymns, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, hymn number 245. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. between two ages. Christ has already come, and Christ will come. What a remarkable time. Brothers and sisters, we have paused in our uh, series in Romans as we move through this Advent season. We'll pick it up uh, in the new year, but receive this benediction from uh, the end of the book of Romans. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel, and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters.
Good morning, Maria. How are you? Okay, how's your hubby? I mean, hubby. How is she? Huh, okay. Is she not coming today? No, no. Oh, I hope it's okay. Yeah, yes. I know what you mean. One of those things. Thank you. 